Can a coloring book help you get your next job interview? Find out today as we welcome Lee McLeod to the show. Are you ready? Let's go! Good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to the brand new You Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you reset and become a brand new you. I'm Ryan Roten, your host, and today we welcome to the show Lee McLeod, the founder of Degrees of Transition. Lee is an accomplished author, blogger, and speaker. She has been featured by many major career sites such as Forbes, ABC News, Lifehacker, Fox Business, and the U.S. News and World Report. Her work has received numerous accolades, including being named one of the 18 best career blogs of 2014, and The Guardian named her as one of the top 10 people to follow on Twitter. Lee has spent nearly 30 years in the corporate America leading and managing global teams on large projects, including a $1.3 billion program while working for Hewlett-Packard. Today, Lee coaches people to create a positive shift in their work life by helping employees develop skills and overcome the obstacles in their jobs. She is the creator of the Job Success Lab and the author of the Resume Coloring Book. Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ryan. I am delighted and honored to be with you today. Thanks for having me. No problem. It's actually, uh, it's, it's funny, you, you know, you reached out to me to kind of get this whole thing started. And uh, when I was thinking about doing a podcast, one of the first thing I I did was I wrote down, okay, if I'm going to do a weekly podcast, I need 52 people that I need to talk to. (laughs) And you were in one of the, you were one of the top 10. Yay. Oh my God. I've never been in the top 10 before. (laughs) (laughs) So it's just funny that you're one of the top 10 people to follow on Twitter. You were in my top 10 list and you actually reached out to me. So thank you very much for doing that. I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you. Well, I am as well. And, you know, it just goes, I mean, you you live in this space, but it just goes to show you the power of social media and how it's really transformed practically everything in our lives, including how easy and uh, simple it is to reach out to people that you don't know, you know, who are have similar interests. It's amazing how many people I've met on Twitter or other parts of social media that, uh, I can have a conversation with that I would have never even known about before. I know. It's pretty awesome. And I have a couple questions for you a little bit later about how we can use social media in the job search. Oh oh God, big time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But but first I have a icebreaker question for you. I would like to know if you could only choose one spot to vacation in for the rest of your vacation days, where would you go and why? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, Mm, just one, huh? Just one. Yeah, I'd have to say, I would have to say Paris. I know that probably sounds really pedestrian, like everybody would say Paris, but I have only been to Paris on business and I just felt so drawn to it. It was like magnetic. And I would probably just have to go there because there's so much to explore. You could go every day and find something different and interesting and fascinating about Paris. It, well, just so you know, you're not the first one to say Paris. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, I've never been, but um, we did go to Italy a few a couple years ago. I liked yeah. Italy, but I, Paris is on my list of my bucket list of places to go. Yeah, it had been for a long time, and it's funny because I worked a lot in Europe, but they kept dragging me to Brussels and Geneva. Okay, not that there's anything wrong with Brussels <laughs> and Geneva, but there's a lot more exciting places to go in Europe than Brussels and Geneva. And I was like, oh my gosh! I finally I had to choreograph a meeting in Paris just to get there. That's how I eventually got to Paris. And I've been back a a couple of times, but you know, it's like you get in, you do a bunch of work stuff and you roam the streets at, you know, nine o'clock and see what you can see. And then a couple days later, you're out of there on a plane. So. Okay. So I'm going to move into pick one and why. So I'm going to give you two choices. You choose one of one over the other and then tell me why. Do you think job candidates would be better off with a personal website or a LinkedIn account? It depends, but I think for the vast majority of job candidates and the way that jobs are hired right now, you know, if you go through the mainstream, like the organizations that you've been in and I've been in, I think probably LinkedIn is the common uh, unifier between employers and candidates. So right now, I would say for the majority of mainstream job searchers, 
I would say LinkedIn. Okay. I think if you're in a, if you're off the mainstream, like you're you've got you're high creative, you're design oriented, you're graphics oriented, then you probably want to talk about a website. Okay, well, so LinkedIn ra- wins round one. Let's go. Yeah. Let's, let's stick with LinkedIn. And would you cho- would you say LinkedIn or a resume? Oh come on, you're killing me here. Um, <laughs> well, you have to be biased a little bit on this one, right? Well, yes, but I have there's a there's a real secret behind the resume piece which we'll get into later. I still think most employer systems are geared to a piece of paper or an application that you submit, and until that changes, I think at some level you need a resume or some version of it that you can submit into an employer ATS system. So for right now, I would say resume, although I would also say I've heard recruiters say if I can't find you on LinkedIn, I'm throwing you in the discard pile. So it seems to me like the story that recruiters say is, a resume lands at my desk. I turn to LinkedIn to look you up. If you aren't there, I throw your resume in the discard pile. So I'm mm-hmm. thinking the sequence right now is resume LinkedIn from the recruiter standpoint. Okay. Yeah, that, that's fair. And I know, yeah. um, I know a lot of uh, recruiters have reached out to me in the past uh, via LinkedIn, but it's almost always because they found my resume somewhere else too. Right. I think if it's passive, they're going to find you on LinkedIn. If, if it's active, you've got to have a resume to pursue the employer for sure. Yeah. So speaking of resumes, which would you rather see on a resume, an objective statement or a professional summary? Oh, gosh. Come on. This is a setup. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, a professional summary. And that's what I teach and that's what I do for clients. And it, um, there are occasions when an objective statement makes sense. And I was in a panel, speaking on a panel, in, for a nonprofit that does employment support uh, last year, I think it was. And she was, say, for example, you want, want to go work for someone like Edward Jones or one of those organizations where you create a business within their business. So um, you're kind of setting up your own agency within their agency, if you may. And what she was saying is, she said, I want to see an objective because I want to know you want to start your own business and you want to have control over your destiny, Mm. which is really interesting. So there are times when an objective statement is helpful. Also, maybe if you're doing a huge career switch and people aren't clear why you're looking for something different than all the experience you have on your resume, that could be a time when you want to think about an objective statement. Although I'd still think there's maybe a better label than that. Let's stick with the resume for a minute. I, I recently read, uh, and I don't remember where it's not coming to me, but every job on average gets roughly 250 resumes. Resumes, yeah. That's a, and, that's a research point somebody dug up there, yeah. Yeah, and out, so out of those 250 resumes, I also read that roughly seven seconds of, of share of eyeball, if you will, is given mm-hmm. to each one of those resumes. Mm-hmm. So with, with so many resumes and such a short duration of time to look mm-hmm. at them and move on to the next one or, you know, set it into the check next pile or the don't mm-hmm. check next pile. Right. In, in your opinion, what, what makes a resume stand out? Well, um, let's start with, there are 250 other resumes. There are also, how many emails do you get a day? True. You know, how much mail do you open? How many people are standing at your door waiting to talk to you? How many voicemail do you have? How many texts are you getting? So I think it's not just that you're competing with the 249 other resumes. You're also competing with the other noise in the entire workplace environment. And often those resumes are not being read on desktops. Desktops, they're being read on iPads or other mobile devices. God forbid they're read on a phone. So I think your question about what does it take to stand out is what I tell people when I'm teaching classes or coaching them is what I think makes you stand out is break the pattern, you know, break the pattern of what they're looking at. If you think about the way most resumes look, they have kind of a vague similarity. They're black and white. They have a lot of text. Um, often they have objective statement after objective statement after objective statement. So I think what, what makes a resume stand out is initially because it's so such a visual process, don't look like everybody else. Break the visual pattern that that recruiter or hiring manager is in as they're scrolling, scrolling, scrolling to, through the next. And at least make grab their eyeballs and make them stop and look at yours. That would be one way to in, expand that uh, share of eyeball, which is funny because I use that term too. It's like up your share of eyeball. Uh, right. 
and get more than that seven to ten seconds. Yeah, and in the in the resume in the resume coloring book, you actually have, I believe, four different resume styles mm-hmm. um, that you talk about in show. Right, and the one that I use a lot, and in fact, I really encourage uh, almost every client I have to use it is where you we have a left hand column on the left hand side of the page where mm-hmm. I put the contact information, and that it's different. You know, and in a lot of, uh, I had a finance major, recent grad, who uh, a couple of years ago said, I don't know, just really not comfortable with that. I just, eh." you know, he was very conservative, wanted to wear a suit and tie to work the whole nine yards. He's like, I just, I don't like that. I think it's too out there. I said, okay. So we did a very basic resume. And about two two or three weeks later, he came back. He's like, you know, I think we should try that other, I think we should try that other (laughs) resume. (laughs) I'm like, yay. So we did it. And I think it's it's different. It's also good content, but I think good content and something that doesn't look like everything else will at least get you a couple more seconds to get into that we should talk to you later pile. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you. When I saw it, I, I immediately went, wow, that's way different than what I was taught. Yeah. Um, but like you said, it's different enough that I think it does capture your attention. I know e- even the examples in the book, I kept wanting to make them, you know, make them bigger, pinch them so they'd be bigger so I could say, okay, what is that? That's interesting to me. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I also think, remember, there's good content on there um, because I do write a professional summary and then we go right into core competencies that are based on the keywords that the employer is looking for in that job. And I just gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago where one of the statistics is that something like only 27% of candidates actually tailor a resume to a specific job, which mm-hmm. is criminal because an employer can see a mass produced resume, you know, from 50 feet. Right. And, and I don't believe in mass produced resumes. I make my clients custom tailor every single resume. We include the name of the job and the name of the employer in that professional summary. So if nothing else, if that person's scrolling, 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 boring, they all look the same. If they see a resume that says this job at this employer and those two words happen to be bolded, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, they wrote this resume for me. You know, if nothing else, it will stand out from what look like mass produced resumes. The resume coloring book is is actually not just about resumes, right? It's, it's actually a kind of a suite of documents mm-hmm. that all complement each other and all can be used during the job search process. Right. You've color coded mm-hmm. each one of them and you've broken them all down into sections. So for example, on the resume, you've got it broken into six sections. You've six got sections. Yep. The mm-hmm. professional summary, core competencies, experience, education, and additional information. Right. Which section do you see people struggle the most with? Well, I think first of all, uh, you may not, you may be surprised to know this, but uh, resume template is one of the most frequently searched terms on the internet. Hmm. And when people kind of reach out to me, sometimes they'll say, "Do you have a good template?" And I have to restrain myself from <laughs> <laughs> grabbing a sharp pencil and sticking my eye and say, "It's not about the template. It's it's really about the content in the template." And I think. Because of that seven to 10 second, uh, you know, kind of eyeball crunch, I think right now, two of the most essential pieces are that top piece, that professional introduction and that core competency section. Because we know that's that survey that Glassdoor did that talked about the seven to 10 seconds also said that that top one third of your resume is crucially important in t- terms of what happens to that decision maker when they first review you? So I think for that reason, and and that really, what what I tell people is, um, for example, I have clients that say, well, we're saying something in core competencies, and then we're saying it down below in experience. I said, hey, don't give the reader too much credit here. You know, seven, to, you're getting seven to ten seconds. There's entire sentences on your resume that probably will not even be read in the initial pass, in the initial pass, but they but they may be used to guide a conversation later. So I think it's. It's those, I would say it's those top two pieces, that top 30% of your resume, critically important in terms of grabbing them by the collar and saying, look at me, look at me. You got to pick me. You know, that's like a website too. You've everything above the fold. When when you first load a website, it's that top third yep. of your website that you either right. capture somebody's attention or they're off onto the next site. 
Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. It's the same concept. And we just, people have so much coming at them these days that you really have to be intentional about saying, okay, how am I going to get their attention? Attention. What can I do here to really make myself relevant? I think a lot of a lot of resume people who are writing their own resumes, particularly, don't really explore that question as deeply as they should. Yeah. So I mean, as you, as we talk about core competencies and experience, you you talk quite frequently to recent grads or people who are getting ready to graduate, and I know it can be challenging for them to identify you know their experience that they should put on a resume. But right. for people like me who have more work experience. Mm-hmm. You know, how, how can you, how can we use the ethos model to help mm-hmm. us identify our core competencies and experiences that we should put on resumes? Well, I think that's so interesting because, you know, we launched the online course for the resume coloring book at Washington State University just like two weeks ago. And we were reading through comments last night and somebody said, well, I have a lot more experience than a lot of these other, you know, undergrads. So I would really appreciate more examples of people with more experience. So we're actually adding that in. But I think the piece, uh, so there, I think there's two things. One, one part, Ryan, that I find people are really, that people really struggle with, and I struggled with it when I was in a big corporate environment as well, is we are the worst judges of our own capabilities. Yeah, Amen. <laughs> you know, we're, we're so judgy. Um, and I even say that to, to young adults because they're like, oh, I was just a clerk in a store. I don't care why any, I don't know why anybody cares. You know, I was managing a $1.3 billion program and I'm sure I was having conversations with my manager going, now really, am I, do you think I'm doing a good enough job here? I mean, we're terrible about often about assessing ourselves. So one thing I would say is find someone to help you when you're looking at what are my core competencies, find someone to help you kind of walk through and assess that because often we will shut the conversation down in our heads before it even gets out of our mouths. We're like, well, nah, I didn't really do that by myself. That doesn't really count. Or, oh, I had this project. Well, you know, really it was a big team. So now nah, I'm, you know, that may be true, but at the, at the essence of it, you know, you did something to make something happen, to implement a change, to have an impact on the organization in some way. And so those are the things that I encourage people to think about is you were there for a purpose. Because, you know, often one of the things that we try to stay away from in the resume coloring book, and I spend a lot of time talking about quantification, is often when I get resumes from clients, it's a list of tasks. Did this, did that, did this, did that. Mm-hmm. And then, and my favorite was responsible for, yay. That's like my least favorite word uh, <laughs> phrase that I would ever want to see in a resume. So they end up li- like listing a job description, but, but a resume is really an influence based document. So instead of just looking at what you did as, especially as experienced people, we want to say, well, geez, what impact did I have on this organization? I mean, obviously hired me for a reason. So I got, I kept getting raises and promotions, right? So at some level, this organization is better by my being here than not. So what did I do that made this organization better? Mm. And instead, in that way, you can take, maybe take some of the judgment out of it. And, and because there are differences, you know, whether you improve the quality of the people, the environment, the, um, the revenue coming in, the expenses going out, the customer relationships, the um, supply chain processes, whatever it is, you obviously had an impact. And if you start looking at it from the side of an impact, then you can kind of back into, well, wait a minute, what core competencies did I use to make that happen? Right. How, if you're mm-hmm. a, if you're an older job seeker, so for example, let's say you, you work for a volunteer, you volunteer for a, a nonprofit in the evenings mm-hmm. and you take on a leadership role in that, that mm-hmm. is, you know, it's, it's above, I'll, I'll use this term loosely, but it's above your type of role that you hold in your own company. Mm-hmm. And so the experience that you're gaining is very good experience. It's just mm-hmm. not a quote unquote job. How, mm-hmm. how would you highlight that to a potential employer? I would list it as a job. One of the things uh, I just I just wrote I think a LinkedIn or I, I just wrote this somewhere, but I wrote that one of the biggest mistakes I see people actually, whether they're younger or more experienced, make is to take something like leadership and volunteer work and list it under interests. Mm-hmm. Because leader, especially for younger adults, uh, if you're a leader in a fraternity, for example, that's a 
kind of like a job. So I would put it in there. I also do that with student athletes. I tell student athletes, treat your experience as a student athlete as a job because there's a lot happening in that space. Volunteer. And when people want to, uh, the example that you have where you're a volunteer leader or something at night and you're getting different kinds of experiences, people that want to change careers or go in a new direction, that could provide awesome you know, capability evidence for a resume and a job search process. So I would treat that as if it were absolutely a job. And instead of it being, you know, uh, Acme Corporation, your employer is, you know, Neighborhood House, Portland, Oregon, Hmm. and then you list the, the job you did. Because it really is about what are the skills and competencies you bring and what evidence do you have to provide that you have those those skills and competencies. Hmm, interesting. Um, I, I just finished yeah. a, a two and a half year term with a nonprofit where I was president of the board for a year, uh, almost two years of it. Wow. And, and I don't have that on my resume, but it's on my LinkedIn profile. Yeah, it should totally, I would totally put that on your resume if huh, it's in service of where you want to go next. You know, it definitely should be on your resume in terms of your, um, you know, kind of your, you know, your document where you store everything you know, that you've ever done. And then you pull over what you need into your resume. But um, I would definitely include something like that. It speaks to leadership and anyone who has ever served on the board of a nonprofit knows what an incredible challenge that can sometimes be. <laughs> yeah, if you, yeah. It's very difficult to get volunteers to, and re, you have to always remember they're volunteers. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You, you mentioned standing out earlier and your mm-hmm. examples in the, in the, in the book indicate this, but do you recommend actually using color on a yeah. resume? It's so funny because when I, uh, probably because I was naive and didn't know better, I didn't know that color was a bad idea until I started reading blogs and, and taking more classes. And I was like, oh, everybody hates color. I have sent, I can't even tell you how many clients out into the world with color on their resumes. And no one has ever come back to me and said, Oh, by the way, they hate the color. So I, I am an ad. I mean, I think we have to be careful. You have to know what system you're going into and if, you know, an automated track, an applicant tracking system can, can handle it or not. But, but I do think if you're having an informational interview, if you're sitting across from that person, if you're in an interview and often when you're emailing resumes as a, as a PDF, which is often how a lot of my, the people that I work with are making initial contacts because I'm not a big fan of job boards. So I'm not encouraging them to go in as a first step on a job board. The first step is, you know, the informational interview, the networking, the contact with a hiring manager. And then it's like, oh, we have a job, go ahead and apply. So for that, I find the resume, the color on the resume, I think, again, it makes you look different. And then I also think when you have that, again, that suite of documents, so you have the cover letter, you have the resume, you have the interview leave behind, you have the references, and they're all branded to be look and feel the same. Uh, to me, it's as if you you just present yourself differently from the other candidates. And then if you interview well and you've prepared well, you become a student of the organization. I think it all flows together. I, do I think, oh, I'll just put color on my resume. And if you still have a you know, kind of a crappy resume, is that going to help you? It might get them to look, but then when they realize, well, there's no real content on here, they'll keep going. So I think it's both and. When I was talking with a friend not too long ago who said, you know, I, I've been in the same role for seven years now, and, mm-hmm. and I think it's time for a change, but mm-hmm. I just don't know where to start. Mm-hmm. And, and it sounds to me like, you, you, well, you just said job boards aren't your favorite. Nope. Where does someone like that, where, where do you recommend they turn if, as they're starting to begin their new job search process? This is such a great and important question because right before we were talking, I was Skyping with a gal in Sweden and she, it's so funny because the problem is universal. She just said, I don't want to keep doing what I'm doing. And I, have spent all this time looking at jobs and I never hear back, which is why I don't suggest that. And and she said, I just don't even know where to start. So we walked through this very same conversation. So what I tell people is this is, this is my um, process that I use with clients and it is so much more rewarding and satisfying than job boards. Does it take more time? Yes. Is it to take more energy? Yes. Is it frustrating and annoying at times? Yes. But so is applying on a job board for hours on end and never hearing back. 
So what I tell people is start with, I call it job search from the inside out. So the problem with a job board is you have no control over that process and you're driving your process externally. I'm sitting here, I'm going to apply to a bunch of jobs online. You have no control over what happens, who sees your information, if you get through the gates of the ATS, et cetera. So you're, you're giving up control of your job search. What I encourage people to do is start from the inside out. And I have every client do a strengths finder assessment. You know, uh, Tom Rath and the Gallup organization have done quite a number of self-assessments. Like the, I think they did the emotional intelligence one and the strengths finder one. Yep. So I have everybody start with strengths finder. And even if you're an experienced professional, I think it'll just give you a breath of fresh air about what you bring to the table. Because often we don't think about that stuff day to day. We're in our eyeball deep in our job. No, I, I agree with that 100%. I, I've actually taken Strengths Finder. There's another one uh, by Marcus Buckingham who came Buckingham. from Gallup mm-hmm. called Standout. Mm-hmm. And I just recently discovered one uh, by Sally Hogshead called The Fascination Advantage. Oh, interesting. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, that one is out of the three. I like that one the best. Okay, good. And, but what amazes me about all three of them is they, you know, if you put the Venn diagram, you, you mm-hmm. almost you, you almost have one circle, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, because because they overlap so much, and you know I taking taking multiple you know two of them really lets you go okay yeah that's it's not just one assessment telling me that about myself it's another one and I, I think they're very valuable for helping you understand you and really begin because you know I believe at some point we all have to align who we are with yes. what we do for a living absolutely I absolutely agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. And I think if we start from strengths, the, the reason, I, the other reason I love strengths uh, based work is, when, and on Strengths Finder, you get the five words that are your five top strengths. Yeah. It's all positive and it's all about you. So often when a young adult, and frankly, even older adults, they go, oh my gosh, that's totally me. I'm like, yeah, isn't that awesome? <laughs> so now you can describe yourself. You know, when you're talking to people in informational interviews and networking, you say, oh, well, you know, I'm really good at this. Or, oh, you know, I'm t- you know I take psychic response. I take psych- psychological ownership of anything that I do. I'm just, you know, if you give me a project, I own it. And, to, and they can say it with confidence because they've probably already done it. They've already demonstrated it. But now they have kind of the words to describe it. It makes them much better storytellers. You know, when you're talking about your brand, you know, it really comes down to, you know, a lot of those strengths are really what your brand is all about as well, your own personal brand. Uh, so I have them do strengths finder, and then I go, I, I actually want, walk them through a qualities exercise. So I'll say to you, you know, Ryan, what are the, because a lot of times when people want to change jobs, they only realize, they only think about what they don't like. Mm-hmm. You're like, what do I want to change? And there's a, a piece we miss there, which is, well, wait a minute, what's working well? You know, what do you like doing in that job? So in addition to your strengths, then I have people um, go through a qualities exercise. So like, what are the qualities you want in a job and in an employer? Because a lot of people, when they change jobs, they go like, I don't know what I want to do. Meaning I don't know what title of a job I should be looking for. So forget the title. Right. Just take the title off the table. Focus on, I want to do work that has these qualities. You know, I want to work with people or animals, or I want to work with numbers. I want to work in a group. I want to work alone. I want to work on sciences. I want to work in programs. I want to work making change. I want to work where nothing changes. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a good point because especially, you know, people in my generation, so Gen Xers, you know, we were, we were taught to go after the title. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's, that's the thing that you thought about. You want to be a vice president. You want to be a director. Right. And then at some point in our lives, hopefully all of us go, you know what? I want to do work that matters. I want to do something that, you know, aligns with who I am. And right. another thing that I think Gen Xers are kind of, are, are bad at, not all of us, but a, 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 the vast majority of us is the mm-hmm. use of social media. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have too many quote unquote friends who use Facebook, for example, as an excuse for not going to a psychologist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, outside of that, for h- how do people make effective use of social media as a part of their job search mm-hmm. process? You know, which which tools should they use? Should they look for a job on Facebook? Is Twitter better yes. uh, or or does it or does it matter? 
Both and, yes, and. I think anyone who doesn't, uh, and it surprises me because I work a lot with young adults, and I'm always shocked when I say to people, so are you on Twitter? Well, I have an account, but I really don't do anything. Um, I think they really need to understand how to use it, and I think it's, I think it's all and. I mean, I think Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and you know, probably to some degree Instagram, although I haven't seen that as much, are all really critically important pieces in the job search, uh, first of all, one of the, when you talk about earlier about like, well, what do I want to do next? One of the th- best things I think you can do when you're looking is, even if you don't know the title of the job or the specifics in that sense, you can be specific about what you want. So I've been on LinkedIn groups, which makes me crazy, <laughs> where a, a recent grad will go, hey, I just graduated with a degree in communications. Does anybody know any jobs? delete. Oh my gosh. Right. I, I can't help you. Nobody can help you, you know, but if you go on Facebook and say, Hey, everyone, as you know, I'm thinking about a career transition. Obviously you don't want to say this. If your boss is one of your Facebook friends, you right. know, I'm thinking about a career transition. I really want to work with animals. I want to be in downtown Chicago. You know, I've got a great background in this and I'm looking to talk to people who might be working in these areas. Oh, now if somebody can read that and go, Oh, well, okay. I can help you. Right, right. Right. So in in that case, I think Facebook can be a great way to use your social network to help your professional cause. Uh, in addition to the fact that probably most, you know, I'm a believer in instead of being online, develop a list of target organizations you want to work for and go after them. So if they're on Facebook, if they do postings, you can start creating that social relationship with those organizations you know, even before you apply, ever apply for a job there or talk to a hiring manager. I just had a friend of mine come to me and say they were considering applying for a job at a specific com- company. And I, mm-hmm. and I said, well, you know, are they hiring yet? And, she's, and she said, no, but they just announced they're going to expand. Mm-hmm. And I told her, well, right now is the perfect time for you to yes. start beginning to build a relationship with people within yes. that company before you ever give them a resume. Ah, that's exactly right. I mean, our our process is you you target those employers, you do a bunch of research. I think the big thing that most people underestimate on the job search is that it's really a research project. And instead of diving in and starting applying for jobs, take a week or two or three, whatever you need, and just like look at postings and descriptions and people's profiles and company profiles until your eyes are bleeding because there's so much information out there that you you don't even know what you don't know. So by doing a lot of research first, you can get a sense for, oh, this is how people talk about solving this problem or, oh, this is how they talk about doing that work or, oh, gee, I didn't know in the uh, you know, in the sustainable energy field, they had this kind of a job. So there's so many things that you don't know. You have to do the research first. Then, yes, then you start connecting into those organizations. You could do that individually through LinkedIn. You can use LinkedIn to find connections in your org- in organizations or your target organizations. Twitter. I mean, every organization in the world is on Twitter. Yep. And a lot of those organizations have recruiters on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And and if you're on Twitter and you're a recruiter, uh, you know people are going to find you and ask you stuff. And again, you know, as I say frequently, the thing about Twitter is there's no gatekeeper. <laughs> you know, Correct. if that person if that person is online and they've tweeted recently, you can have a one to one conversation with them, and nobody's answering their phone and nobody's screening their email. It's one to one. Yep. And uh, I think m- most job seekers wholly underestimate uh, the incredible. Uh, gold mine that Twitter is relative to the, to the job search. Yeah, I agree. You can, I mean, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Gary Vaynerchuk, but he released, uh-huh. he released his book, jab, 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 right hook. Earlier right hook. This year. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. I mean, to me for the job seeker, uh, you can easily go on Twitter and, and find those recruiters within the company and you can jab and jab mm-hmm. and jab. And then eventually you're going to have that opportunity to throw that right hook. Exactly. That's that's exactly right. And again, it's not a transaction, right? It's not apply for a job online, submit a resume. Oh, gee, maybe they'll call me. It's not like that. It is. It's relationship based yeah. self marketing and promotion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. 
Um, I have a question uh, regarding cover letters. So I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. you've got this suite of Sweet. documents within the, the resume coloring book. Right. One mm-hmm. of them is a cover letter. So I'm yep. going to ask a question that I already know the answer to, but okay. I want to hear, I want to hear your answer. Okay. How important are, are cover letters even important today? Um, I would say yes. I've had clients say to me, I don't need a cover letter for this, right? I, and I'm like, <laughs> yes, you do need a cover letter for that. Uh, I think they are, for, uh, and I've, I've done a bunch of research and I've asked recruiters, you know, what the story is. And I, I read a, a, a dreadful statistic that said 97% of recruiters say they don't read cover letters. However, uh, I would say they don't read cover letters because most cover letters are so terribly written. They just are like, I'm not even going to try that. Mm-hmm. And I and I only know that because when clients say, oh, here's a cover letter I've been using, you know, they're really bad. They're really bad. And the reason is that people don't understand, you know, one of the biggest things about whether your resume or write, whether you're writing a resume or a cover letter or you're having an informational interview, I think the thing that gets lost when most people approach those situations is what is my purpose here? Why am I doing this? What is the intention what is the objective of doing this? And if you th- and beca- when you don't, when you aren't clear on your purpose, then you throw every sentence under the sun on a cover letter because you're not really sure why you're even doing it. Mm-hmm. But if you sat there and thought, well, I want to give the employer three great reasons why they should read this letter and why they should continue on and read my resume and then why they should call me for an interview. I think I'll do that in my cover letter. Okay, now it's very clear. So I think most letters don't get read because they're bad, badly written, poorly written. And I think if you, and I think most writers aren't clear on their purpose. When you lose purpose, you know, the game's over because you'll never be able to get your message across. So when I think when you write a really clear cover letter, what I tell clients is it gives you two great pieces of marketing material instead of one. Mm, Because a well-written cover letter that's simple, skimmable, designed well, is a, is a way that you can make yourself memorable and stand out from the other icky cover letters or the, uh, the absent cover letters and help you in your, in your effort to attract that employer's attention. At this point, we've talked about you know, getting the resume put together, doing a cover letter. We've conducted our due diligence. We've selected mm-hmm. some companies that we want to apply for. Correct. And now because we've been following the process in the resume coloring book, right, we have a yep. high likelihood that when we submit our resume, just mm-hmm. like 90% of the other people who follow your process, we're going to get right. an interview. Yep. So we wake up one morning and we get a phone call that says, hey, can you be here in three hours? Right. What can we do to get ready for an interview in three hours? You can do a lot. Uh, first of all, do not panic. Uh, second of all, it's a good reason why you should always have your stuff ready to go and ink in your printer and all that because people do get called for interviews in three hours or sometimes less. So in the first hour, just make sure you've got all your information about the company, everything you want to bring with you, stats and figures you want to know, uh, research you've done, which presumably because you've been on their list, you already know a bunch about them. Now, the second hour is focus your answers and responses on what that employer needs. Really think through okay, what problem am I going to help this employer solve? Like, why are they going to hire me? Like, what's the purpose of this job in their organization? And how can I totally rock it? So really get clear. And that's where you can spend time practicing your responses, which hopefully you've done before, so that when you get that last minute call, you're really clear about how you can present yourself, practice your responses. It's different practicing out loud than it is in your head. You have to practice interview responses out loud. You have to have the methodology for telling your story uh, in a way that's concise and compelling. So if you have all those fundamentals, then you're going to be practicing in hour two. And then hour three is get yourself physically ready. So figure out what you're going to wear. I know that's a big piece. It's, you know, don't just throw something on. You really think strategically, what am I going to wear? And then what I love to encourage people to do, especially if they've got great work experiences, what are you going to bring with you that provides compelling evidence of how you can help this organization? Maybe you have work product that you can bring, projects that you've worked on. Uh, If people don't want to bring like branded work product, I say, you know, maybe sit down and make up a couple slides and say, here was the problem I had in my job and this is the steps I walked through to solve it. So, you know, if it's relevant to that job. So even though you can't bring in your company's materials, say, you could still draw them a picture of what your approach to solving a problem was or managing a program or raising more money or getting more donors or whatever the case may be. 
Um, I had a client that went in, she was in, uh, in a civil engineering field and had worked at one company for a long, long time, but she had all this great documentation and we talked about that and, and she brought in, she had like her little file box and she said, Oh Lee, it was amazing. She said, they'd say we were talking about a certain aspect of a new construction project and she'd say, Oh, well, let me show you what I did on this and such and such a project. And I just, she goes, I went over to my file box and I got my document and then I, sh- I was able to show them mm what I had done. She got the job. And uh, so it's really that last hour you can use to really, you know, kind of bring, what are you going to bring with you? What work product or evidence can you bring that's visual, compelling, something that can see the way you think and approach problem solving? Yeah, I think that's a critical thing to point out is that the job interview is not for you to get a job. It's for you to show the company how you can help them solve problems. Right. And I think for a lot of, that's why when you, when you read the resume coloring book, you, you can tell there's a theme there that a lot of, uh, I think a lot of college grads and young adults forget that it's not about you getting a job. It's about you solving their problem. And that's why they'll hire. It's the only reason an employer will hire you ever because you have the ability to help them solve a business problem. So everything you put on that resume cover letter or bring with you is about you saying, look, I'm going to help you solve this problem. Here's how. Yeah, and and that actually brings in the last two documents that you discuss in the resume coloring book. One is the reference document. Yes. Um, which is typical. It's what people would expect. But the one that I want to spend a little bit of time on because it's relevant to what we're talking about now is you have a document called the leave behind, mm-hmm. which is brilliant. I mean, I, I read that and I was like, wow, that is a fantastic idea. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yes, exactly. Well, one of the, um, one of the, I, I actually did it with the intention of helping interviewees close the deal. So what I was finding is often when I talk to young adults, particularly, although older adults too, I'll say, did you ask for the job? Did you want the job? Yes. Did you ask for the job? Well, no, I, you know, I thought that was a little forward. And I remember in my days as a hiring manager, you know, we would go around, have people interview with five or six people. Then we'd all get in a huddle. We'd be like, okay, what do you think? And the first people that we tossed out of the pile would be this comment. Well, I, I don't know. It just didn't seem like they wanted the job, hmm. right? Interesting. As a manager with the job I had, there's no way I'm hiring somebody who doesn't want that job, right? right. So what I found was people were very reluctant to say, I want this job and I want to know anything you need to know from me that will enable you to make me an offer. The interview leave behind is really a crisp summary, basically two columns. And on the left-hand column, we describe what are the most important requirements that the employer has for that job. So in a way, you're saying to the employer, look, I've studied you, I've looked at this job, I've really absorbed it, and this is what I see as the main things you want that need to be done in this role. And then on the right-hand side, you're providing bullet points of evidence that say, and this is how I'm prepared to help you solve those problems. So you're basically summarizing the evidence that you've presented that says, look, I'm the candidate you should make an offer to, and here's why. People love using that because they feel so confident. You know, they're like, yeah, I used the interview leave behind, and I told them I wanted the job, you know, and it was just, you know, they were blown away because, you know, let's assume 95% of the interview candidates don't do that, especially on the younger, you know, I think at a younger age. Yeah. It's really powerful because as a manager at the end of my tenure at HP, I actually started requiring candidates to bring work product with them. Hmm. And a lot of other, you know, PR people do PR tests and, and financial analysts do financial Excel tests and stuff like that because I wanted to see how they did work. And it's one way that you can, if you didn't have work product to bring, but it's one way you can really position yourself to close and say, I want to let you know, and I script them, (laughs) you, you know, I want you to say, I want to let you know without any hesitation that I want this job. And not only do I want this job, here's how I'm going to totally rock this job when you make me an offer, right? You know, what a close, you know, and people call me and say, oh, I asked for the job. I told them I really wanted it. And even if they don't get the offer, it's so empowering because they know they can make that request when the situation is right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. For me, the, the, the book itself is worth the money for that particular section because it was an idea for me that 
um, frankly, I had never considered before. And I was like, wow, I've got to start doing this. Right. Well, thanks for saying that. I'm really, I, I love hearing that feedback because it really is, I think the interview, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about both the resume and the interview. And I think the interview is so important because it's your chance. First of all, you will never get feedback when you leave that room. When you leave that room and they don't offer you a job, you're going to get, well, we went with somebody with more qualifications. Mm -hmm. But the, the interview leave behind really sets you up to ask that question. What would prevent you, based on everything you've heard and this evidence, what would prevent you from making me an offer? What questions do you have in your mind? And you might be able to have a much more constructive conversation about that, and you might even be able to influence the decision. Right. Yeah. It, it, like I said, it was it was great. I saw it. I was like, okay, another, another. It was one of those moments where you you read it and you go, oh man, why didn't I think of that? There was a Gallup survey that came out not too long ago that suggests that about 70% of employees at work are disengaged from their job. Right. And I'm wondering, do you think leaving work on time would help restore employee engagement? Well, one of my mantras is leave work on time. I, I think I actually have leaveworkontime.com if I'm not mistaken. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, I do. I think work, uh, the workplaces have become completely skewed in terms of what's rational and what is not. And I do believe we should leave work on time. And I know people will say, well, Lee, you know, always on and you could do email at night. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but you have a life. You don't just have a work life, you have a whole life. So you have to serve both of those worlds. And I do think we have to leave work on time. I think most people don't leave work on time because they self-sabotage themselves into not leaving work on time. I think we have to have, we have to get much clearer in the workplace about determining what is important work and what is not important work. People who have heard me speak have heard me say this a million times. Not all work is important work. You know, there's, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's the most important priorities and there's everything else. And if your manager can't tell you what the most important work is, then you need to hold them accountable for doing that because there's always a priority li yeah. list. That's right? tough for some managers to do. Then <laughs> it, it, I, I've seen some that are really good at it and I have seen some that are not. Then they need to learn how to do that. And and their employees need to hold them accountable for that. I mean, I do think I think there's a whole host of things. I I don't jump on the happy bandwagon. I don't think you have to be ecstatic and go to work every day. I do think work has to challenge you. I I wanna see us learn at work. I think learn I think work has to push you into out of your comfort zone. Um, I think a lot of reasons people are unhappy at work is that they're filled with fear, a fear of dealing with situations that completely baffle them and frighten them. Yeah. For, you know, standing up to a manager saying, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to leave work at five. What's the most important work I need to do here? Difficult conversations, difficult colleagues, bully bosses, whatever. That's what I coach people in their jobs. That's what I see that often makes them really, really miserable. And I think we just lack the fundamental skills often as people to deal with a lot of those situations and, and where we don't have the confidence. But leaving work on time, uh, you know, I mean, I had to do it after a very difficult situation in my life. And I just said, I can't do 60 hours. And I was shocked at how relatively easy it was to just leave work every day at five o'clock. Yeah, and I think we can do it if we make it a priority. I, if you set your mind to it and you're intentional about it, I think you can do it. Last couple of questions. You just hinted at it. What other services do you offer besides the resume coloring book? Well, I have the resume coloring book and you can find that at resumecoloringbook.com. And it's a heck of a deal because for $47, you get the online book and e-course, which runs about 90 minutes and is always being updated to walk you through those things that you need to to do to um, get a great resume written. And then I also do job search coaching. So I have a job search coaching program where I will stay with you for the entire duration of your job search. So if you are just starting out and you've got to do the entire strategy, I'll help you through that whole thing. I also do re write resumes and LinkedIn profiles. And finally, I also coach you if you're in a job and you're not sure you're either you want to improve on something or you're thinking, I'm not sure if I'm in the right place, or you're dealing with a lot of those fear-based situations where you can't figure out how to deal with a difficult manager, difficult people, or manage your workload, whatever. Uh, I love working with people in those situations and really helping them turn their view of their workplace around. 
So, so those who might be listening or interested in working with you, what are the best ways for them to reach you? The best ways for uh, them to reach me are to shoot me an email at lee at leemcleod.com. And you're going to have the spelling of all that on your site, right, Ryan? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, great. So lee at leemcleod.com. And you can find my two sites. My job search is degreesoftransition.com. And then the job coaching is leemcleod.com. Awesome. Last question. Any final tips, actions, or words of wisdom that you'd like to pass along to anybody who's listening today? Yes. The secret to life is, um, the secret to life is self, um, is really about self-knowledge and self-awareness. And that's what I, what I teach when we're in a job search is you, you're really best served by really having a strong level of self-awareness and knowing where you shine and knowing the things that you need to work on and just being totally transparent about it with yourself. And when I work on in-job coaching, I'm often find myself talking about developing leaders and, you know, self-awareness and self-management is fundamental uh, to leadership. So if you seek to lead, serve, or manage others, start on the inside and work your way out. Man, I, I, well said. I agree with that completely. Yeah, thanks. So, Lee, hey, it has been my privilege and pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you very much. It has been my honor to be here, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. Maybe we can do it again sometime. I hope so. All right. Thanks. Well, I don't know about you, but I thought that was a fantastic interview. And frankly, I could have probably spoken with Lee for another hour. So Lee, once again, thank you very much for being on the show. And speaking of the show, there are just so many great takeaways from Lee in today's episode. For me, uh, one big one was, that, you know, like you, your resume also needs to stand out from the competition. It needs to capture that share of eyeball just long enough for people to want to dig in and learn more about you. The resume coloring book process will help your resume stand out and get you the interview. The job search is no longer about posting and praying on some random job board. That route leaves you with a monster hill to climb. Instead, you need to start building relationships. Use social media to facilitate building those relationships by having discussions with employees and recruiters at the company where you want to work before you need to. You need to make sure that you are researching which companies you want to work for before you apply. And there is absolutely no shortage of information today, so take full advantage of everything that's available. And remember that the research doesn't stop once you've been selected for the interview. You need to continue because you never know when you're going to get a call with three hours notice to come in and interview for a position. But if you follow Lee's hour-by-hour steps, you'll be prepared and ready. The Resume Coloring Book is not just about resumes. It really is an entire suite of documents that are necessary for your job search. The Leave Behind document is especially brilliant. Lee's advice to ask for the job echoes that of Tim Salmir from show four. You need to tell the people you've interviewed with that you want the job. Look them right in the eye, tell them that you want the job, and then hand them that leave behind document so that they keep talking about you once you've left the building. Remember, personal branding is what people feel, think, then say about you when you're not around. The leave behind is a terrific way to leave a lasting impression even after you've left the building. So be sure to check out Lee's site for more information and special offers. She blogs at degreesoftransition.com and leemcleod.com. You can pick up a copy of The Resume Coloring Book at theresumecoloringbook.com. You can find all these links in the show notes at ryanroten.com forward slash Lee. Now, as a podcast listener, you know that one of the best ways you can help this show grow and continue to serve others is to stop by iTunes and leave a rating and review for the show. If you do, not only will I be humbled and grateful, but I will certainly mention you on the show. So what are your thoughts on today's interview with Lee McLeod? If you'd like to share your answers with me, shoot me an email at rlroten at gmail.com, or you can head on over to ryanroten.com forward slash podcast. Right there in the middle of the page is a speak bike button. Click on it and you can record a voice message and send it directly to my inbox. Remember, just because you've done one thing for the first part of your career doesn't mean you have to do the same thing for the next. You have to choose to become a brand new you. So go ahead, press the reset button, and get started today. Thanks for all your support. Until next time, I've been Ryan, and I'm out.